and welcome to Exploring with the Estuarium. My name is Ariel and I'll be your educator. Today we're going to learn how the shorelines of the Puget Sound and Bud Inlet have changed over time and what that might mean to the health of the Sound and those of us who live here. On Oysters and Estuaries Part 2, we will learn about the Olympia Oyster, the building of Olympia's Wharf, and the creation of Capitol Lake. When the tide is out, the table is set. This is an old native saying because they were able to gather so many oysters and clams when the tide was out that they had plenty of food. Several Native American tribes had permanent village sites for shellfish and salmon harvest along the Deschutes River and Bud Inlet. Tribes from around the area came to Bud Inlet to trade goods that included shellfish, smoked salmon, and cattails. The cattails from the surrounding marshland were used to make basketry and mats. The Olympia area was a great summer gathering place for many tribes of the Salish Indians because in the summer there are extreme low tides and it was a great place to gather shellfish in what is now Capitol Lake and the estuary that feeds into it. A longhouse was located near Columbia and Forth where early European settlers went to trade. The early pioneers depended on the shellfish to eat. At a time when there were no grocery stores and the food they could collect made the difference between life and death. The Olympia oyster was a cultural staple to the Native American people who gathered shellfish from the inlets of the Puget Sound. This little oyster used to line the shores of Bud Inlet. In 1854, a long wharf extending from the foot of Main Street was built to export the Olympia oyster. In 1864, the Olympia oyster trade was booming. There was a saying, Olympia, the home of the gods. Olympia oyster, food of the gods. The first commercial harvesters of shellfish in Olympia were native women. Harvest took place at low tide, day or night. Native women used wooden sledges with iron tops to hold small fires for warmth and light while they harvested. In the 1860s, oysters sold for just 25 cents a bag. Early on, Chinese immigrants in Olympia also took up small-scale oyster harvesting in competition with the natives. The Olympia oyster achieved wide fame in the late 1800s. J.J. Brenner opened the first oyster processing plant in 1893 on the shores of Bud Inlet. The Olympia and Chehalis Valley Railroad Depot enabled prompt shipment of fresh oysters to Portland and Seattle. Advances in the 1800s and early 1900s of transportation made exporting of fresh oysters far from the Puget Sound possible. By the early 1900s, the arrival of gas and diesel engines led oyster companies to run their own boats, called tenders. This allowed rapid shipment from the oyster beds to offloading directly to the processing plants built along West 4th Avenue. The Olympia oysters were native to Capitol Lake in both sides of the inlet, but soon the populations began to decline. The effects of dredging, using the fill area as a dump site, wastewater generated by households, and the sulfite pulp mill waste from the lumber processing contaminated oyster beds, ending Olympia oyster harvesting near Olympia. Today, most harvesting on the South Sound takes place in Elbe and Totten Inlets to the west. With the success of oyster export, the city of Olympia and its infrastructure started to expand. In 1856, started the construction of a new bridge connecting downtown Olympia with what was known as Marshville, now West Olympia. Lack of funds halted the project until 1868 when Thurston County gave the city a loan. The Westside Bridge was completed the following year. The first bridge was a cantilevered wooden causeway that later progressed into a wooden drawbridge which allowed boats to travel up the Deschutes to the Olympia Brewery. A series of replacement bridges were built until 1921 when a concrete bridge was installed. A company from Portland was hired by the city in 1887 to dig a channel to build a long wharf to deep water measuring 4,798 feet and built on 976 pilings. And in 1893, the Army Corps of Engineers dredged the channel and deposited the dirt under the 4th Avenue Bridge. The dredging operations made changes to the topography of the city. From 1910 to 1911, a gigantic dredging and filling effort created a deep water harbor and filled the sloughs to the north and east of the city. The fill changed the shape of Olympia by adding 29 blocks of land in an effort which dredged 2 million cubic yards of mud. Much of the land north of Olympia Avenue is fill. 
The cost was $250,000, and with the civic effort, all but $48,000 was paid for by the townspeople. This large project was known as the Carleon Phil, after its organizer and promoter mayor and state legislator, P.H. Carleon. The fill provided industrial sites for the prospering lumber mill industry and finally provided a deep water port adjacent to Olympia. During this process, Capitol Lake was formed from the estuary at the mouth of the Deschutes River. The Deschutes River was eventually dammed in 1951, forming the version of Capitol Lake that we see today. The reflection pond covers about 300 acres. Also at this time, Percival Cove was filled in creating Deschutes Parkway. The railroad was built through Olympia in 1889 and was run along the water on a built-up area that is now the bridge on the south side of the lake. Before Capitol Lake became a destination for recreation and leisure, Little Hollywood formed on the tidal flats below the Capitol building. Little Hollywood was a community of float houses built by Olympia residents hit hard by the Great Depression. It was dubbed Little Hollywood due to the undesirable elements such as alcohol and prostitution. The city founders burnt down the shantytown over a span of two years. They used to allow recreation on Capitol Lake, such as boat racing and swimming. It is no longer safe due to pollution. This is because the lake is filled with runoff from the Deschutes River that carries chemicals and fertilizers from farms and houses downstream to deposit them in the lake. It was dredged twice since it was created, but has not been dredged since 1986. The lake is 60% filled in with material that has been washed down from the Deschutes River. This is as much sediment in the lake now as there was sediment dredged out of Bud Inlet to form the 1911 fill of 29 blocks. Another contamination is that the lake has been invaded by New Zealand mud snails, a small non-native snail that is taking over and is very harmful. Other invasive species that are causing problems are nutria, bullfrogs, blackberries, scotch broom, and the waterweed milfoil. The Deschutes River is a major source of fresh water for the Bud Inlet estuary. Due to the dam, water flows out at low tide and the salt water is blocked from coming in at high tide. Salmon can come in via the salmon ladder. Due to Bud Inlet being mudflats at low tide, a boat dock was installed at the estuary so that at high tide, boats could come in and out. At low tide, the boats just sat on the mudflats. Because of this, they needed to have flat bottoms. So Olympia had a whole fleet of steamships that had big paddle wheels on the back. John Percival was a man who ran a steamship company, and the docks are named after the location where he ran his business for about 60 years. There used to be businesses like oil tanks, coal, gravel, concrete, fruit processing, and plywood factories along the water, but by 1977 they were gone and the city created Percival Landing as a place for citizens to enjoy the waterfront. Extensive dredging of the Olympia Harbor over a number of years has dramatically changed the land and water configuration. In the 1980s, the largest dredging operation was undertaken at East Bay to provide for a private boat moorage facility, land development, and to regulate the boundary on the east side of the Port Peninsula. A deep water shipping channel was also dredged, providing deep water access to the Port of Olympia. The port is dredged to maintain depth for ocean-going ships. When it is dredged, it stirs up the pollutants and they have to settle back down to the bottom. The dredging over many years also filled in the surrounding land, creating a narrow passageway for boats. Currently, one of the concerns with downtown is its shoreline and the rising sea level. As sea levels rise, the excess water floods into the estuaries, acting like a reservoir. Without estuaries, the water will have no detour but will overflow the shoreline and into the floodplain. You can see this by looking at the estimated sea level rise impacts of downtown Olympia. The flood waters inundate the historic shoreline of the estuaries. In the most extreme projections, sea level rise floods almost the entire downtown. The estuaries can lessen the impacts of sea level rise by serving as our environmental sponge. The City of Olympia, Lock Clean Water Alliance, and the Port of Olympia are already planning and implementing sea level rise mitigation strategies. The Sea Level Rise Response Plan was developed in 2018-2019 through the partnership. The response plan will be implemented in phases and will incorporate different strategies of regulation, emergency response, and physical structures to deal with the rising sea levels. Olympia currently takes temporary actions to extreme high tides and flooding, such as sealing street gates, sandbagging, using living shorelines, 
and tide valves that prevent stormwater backflow into low-lying downtown streets. Many changes have happened to Olympia's shoreline over the last 150 years. Next time you're downtown, see if you can find the historical markers on buildings that indicate the original shoreline. And remember, we are all connected to an estuary, so what you do on land or upstream makes a difference. Thanks for joining us on another episode of Exploring with the Estuarium. If you liked our video, give it a thumbs up. And if you wish to continue to get more of our educational videos, please subscribe to our YouTube channel or follow us on Facebook at the Puget Sound Estuarium. Bye.